Good evening. Lord is good. I had to replace myself with announcements since I'm so bad at them. <laughs> so, so Pastor Andrew's going to be doing the announcements for us. Um, we all have our gifts, and that's not mine. Uh, we're in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 tonight. 1 Corinthians, Corinthians chapter 5. We are continuing through the epistle to the church that is super gifted, but also is full of a lot of problems. The Corinthian church. And Paul is writing to them mainly to correct their off doctrine and to see them united together in Christ. You know, we have looks at so far is, is that they were a church that was divided. They were not united. You know, one would say, I am of Paul. Another would say, I am of Apollos. And still another would say, I'm of Cephas, uh, another name for Peter. And they meant that these were the only teachers they would re- receive instruction from. And the real holy ones, they said, I am of Christ. I don't need any instruction from anyone. I just go straight to the Lord and hear from him. And so far in this epistle, we have looked at Paul's correction for them in this area. He has showed them that they were all on the same team. Mainly he and Apollos are not in competition with one another, but that are, that are both, both of them were called by God to work for the kingdom and to bring glory to their Lord that each one of them were stewards and servants of Jesus. And Paul, Paul tells them not to divide, but to know that both he and Apollos were being used by God for them, to encourage and equip them in their walks. And Paul will revisit divisions later in the book. But until we get there, he has a few heavy topics to address in this church. Things like suing each other, the right way to function in marriage, how to walk with a pure conscience in our faith, And the topic we see today in chapter five is sexual immorality and really how to deal with someone who is unrepentant and living in this lifestyle. So yay, fun discussion we're gonna have tonight. But let's pray and then we'll get into the passage. Heavenly Father, we do thank you, Lord, for your presence. Wherever we are tonight, Lord, your presence is real in our life. And I thank you for worship. Thank you that we can just cry out to you from our hearts. And I pray that we have done that tonight, Lord. And I also pray tonight we will do that. After we get encouraged by your word, we will respond to you in praise this evening. You are so good. You are so faithful to us. Open your word to us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Verse 1 of chapter 5, Paul writes, it is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you, and such sexual immorality as is not even named among the Gentiles that a man has his father's wife. Right off the bat, it's like, what? A man with his father's wife? You know, sexual immorality is reason enough for Paul to address this church and correct them. And he will talk more about it at the end of chapter six. But what he brings up here, this is like, yikes. The Greek word for sexual immorality is the word pornea. And that sounds familiar to us, right? It's where we get our word pornography. And we know what pornographic material is. But, but this word covers anything and everything outside of what God designed in marriage. Physical intimacy is to be enjoyed and experienced within the marriage fellowship. In fact, it is good. As it tells us in Genesis chapter 2 and echoed by Paul in Ephesians chapter 5, that the man and his wife are to be united and the two shall become one flesh. And the physical relationship is part of that. But anything outside of what God designed marriage to be is not to be done. It's sexual immorality. It's what's known as fornication. And as Christians, we are to be different. We are to be different than the world. We are to flee those lusts lusts, and walk in purity. To the Thessalonians, Paul writes this, He says, for this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you should abstain from sexual immorality, that each of you should know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor, not in passion of lust, like the Gentiles who do do not know God. Paul says, it is the will of God to remain pure and not to engage in any kind of sexual behavior outside of marriage. And that includes physical relationships before marriage. And if you are married, obviously this means with anyone, we're not to commit any act with anyone other than our spouse. 
But also what, what fits into this word, this definition, is, is what we could fill ourselves with. It is the will of God to remain pure regarding what we watch, what we're looking at online, even our thought lives. He said that each of you should know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor, not in passion of lust, like the Gentiles who do not know God. This is the way unbelievers act and live. Don't live like that. And sexual immorality was all over the place in the city of Corinth. It was a very free and open society in that way. It was the the Vegas Strip in all its glory. It was full of sexual immorality everywhere you looked or went. It was all around the people. But here, Paul says a very, very inappropriate situation is taking place not just inside the city, but with a person in this church, that a man has his father's wife. And even though according to the law in Deuteronomy 22.30, it does say, a man shall not take his father's wife nor uncover his father's bed. But you don't even have to cite the law to realize that that is wrong. Paul writes that it is so inappropriate that even the Gentiles are not doing that sort of thing. It is that bad that people in the world would not even think to commit this extremely immoral sin. They themselves look in at this church and they say, ew, what are they doing? This is just wrong. And you know you have gone too far if you go further than the world. That a man has his father's wife. Now this possibly could mean an incest type relationship with his own mother, but it is more likely an act with this man's stepmom, his father's wife. And saying this man has his father's wife shows that this was not just a one-time occurrence, which would be sick enough, but this is ongoing. It is taking place continually. But what made the situation even worse was the Christians in the church were embracing this couple and accepting what they are doing. Look at verse two. It says, and you are puffed up and have not rather mourned that he who has done this deed might be taken away from among you. Instead of this breaking the Corinthians' hearts and them trying to correct this man in his sin, they let it slide. And not only did they let it slide, they were puffed up about it. They were boasting that they were so gracious and so kind because they accepted what was going on. It's like they were saying, look at how loving we are. We take everyone as they are. Look at how gracious of a church we are. Because we accept them, we are doing amazing things. Instead of correcting them in their sin, they embraced it and they boasted about it. Let me say this. We are all sinners. We all fall short every single day. But our sanctification is an important part of our Christian lives. Sanctification is that growth towards holiness. We talked a little bit about that on Sunday, that as God is conforming us, he is conforming us into the image of Jesus, we have a part to play. And we are to rid those things in our lives that are not pleasing to the Lord. And if there is something in our life that conflicts what we have in God's word, we are to rid that from our lives. And yes, sometimes there is that that wrestling. There's that battling of the flesh where our spirit wants to do the things that are right and our flesh wants to cave in to those ungodly things that we desire. And there are certain areas for each one of us that are hard, continually, that we struggle with. And they're different for us all. You know, the things I might struggle with might be different than the things you struggle with. And the things that you struggle with, I I might not struggle with. But we all do face this battle. We all have this, this ongoing, constant battle with the flesh. It's, it's difficult and it's hard. But I believe that battle is a good sign in one sense because that battle shows that there is a desire in us to follow the Lord, that we are, are struggling to make it and, and to honor the Lord with our lives. That's why there is a battle. But here with this man, there is no battle. That even though he he was part of this church, possibly at one time walking strong in the Lord, he is now fine living his life in this sin. But also, this church is fine with it too. 
And they were celebrating and accepting what he was doing. You know, one of our responsibilities as the body of Christ is to be there for one another. And one way we are to be there for others is to correct, correct them when they go off course. It's definitely not the most fun thing to do, but this is one area that we are called to do as a body of Christ. You know, it's much easier to be there for someone through prayer. When they're going through something, you know, I'll, I'll pray for you. Or if they're struggling and you're in a place that you can help them financially, you monetarily give to them. Or just to build them up with encouraging words. That's an awesome part of the body of Christ. But as the body of Christ, we have the call and the responsibility to warn, rebuke, and get our brothers and sisters back on track when they are involved in a lifestyle that would ne will neg negatively affect or possibly destroy their walk with the Lord. You know, confrontation is hard. Do you really want to go up to someone and say, what you're doing is not good, not pleasing to the Lord? And as someone who calls themselves a Christian, you need to stop. I mean, who likes to do that? Maybe some of you <laughs> like to do that. But for most of us, it's tough. That's a tough thing to do. And one reason is because it might not be well received. You know, maybe that person is a good friend and, and, and you don't want that friendship to be hindered or, or even end because they don't receive the exhortation that you have for them. But we need to remember that our, we are our brother's keeper and we are to care for their souls and their relationship with the Lord. This is one of our roles as the body of Christ. You know, in Galatians 6, Paul tells us, Brethren, if a man is overtaken in any tres trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ." If someone is stuck in sin, we have the responsibility to try and restore them. It, it says that, that, bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. But notice in the Galatians 6 verses, Paul says to do it with gentleness. This is how we are to go to those in sin. We are not to go in the flesh or to let them have it because it feels good. Maybe we're, we're one of those people who says, what are they doing? Oh, I'll handle it. You just sit back. Let me take care of it. You know, I am called to the correction ministry. It's what I do. Let me go get them. You know, Paul says to come humbly and gently, really in the spirit, not in the flesh, not with har a harsh attitude, but with gentleness. And in verse 2, Paul says, pretty much, where is the mourning? Where's the sadness? You know, as we look on and see the actions they are committing, it should lead us to a place of sadness for them. And if we truly care for people, we need to first come to them in a caring, gentle, broken way. Not ignoring their sin, not accepting their, their sin, but also not necessarily slapping in the, them in the back of the head saying, you moron, what's wrong with you? You know, maybe there's people we could do that too, but most, we need to come humbly with that spirit of gentleness. And sin should make us mourn. Sin in our own lives and the lives of others should make us mourn. You know, my, my heart honestly grieves when I look on social media and I see people that once were part of this church, ones I served with, living in complete rebellion against the Lord. You know, when I was a, a worship leader for all those years, I had the privilege of serving with a lot of different people. And some have continued to serve the Lord in great ways. I mean, Jason, who leads us faithfully all the time. <laughs> you know, this man has been serving Jesus alongside me for the past 20 years. You know, and, and I celebrate when I think of where Jason has been taken by the Lord, how God has built him up, how he's anointed him, how he's blessed him. I'm sure you guys are so blessed every time we get to together and, and get to worship the Lord through, through his leading. But there are others that I've served with who are no longer here at the church who I can't even look at their Instagram posts because all I see is crudeness and what I hear is profanity. And, and I see this, this love of sexually impure things. And I mourn because at one time God called these people 
and was using them for his glory. And for me, when, when I served with them, they were leading people into authentic praise with their lives. And now they're out there living their lives in a way that does not honor the Lord. My heart's grieved. May our hearts be grieved when people fall back into the world. And may we warn them that, that those lives that they're living will lead to destruction. Now Paul wants them to take action, and he is the first one who does. In verse 3, he says, For indeed, as absent in body, but present in spirit, have already judged, as though I were present, him who has so done this deed. Wait, 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 Paul. Jesus said, Judge not, lest you be judged. You know, some years ago, this was temporarily one of the most popular, popularly quoted verses. Don't judge me. You guys heard that, right? Don't judge me. No, we're not supposed to judge others. Only God is to judge people. So you cannot say anything about my life. You know, people who say this usually hold to the idea that Jesus commanded a total acceptance of any lifestyle choices. And we are in no way ever supposed to speak up about it. You know, it's true in some ways we are not to judge others. But Jesus is referring to judging regarding condemnation upon their life. You know, we do not know their hearts. We do not know their internal motives. Only God does. So we don't have the right to condemn people. That's God's responsibility. But we are to judge. We are to observe their actions and behavior. And we have the responsibility to warn them of their sinful conduct. We take the truths of God's word And if someone's life is not matching up, we're to tell them. Now, it's not that we are to go around sin sniffing, going, what's wrong with them? What what, what are they doing? I bet you they're doing something wrong. And I'm just gonna keep, keep watching until it comes out. No, we're not to be looking for all the ways people fall short. But when the Lord allows us to see that sin that they are practicing, we are to warn them that the path they are on is a path that really will endanger their lives that will ultimately lead to loss. We don't have a right to judge their souls, but we have the responsibility to inform and caution it. I like how Warren Wiersbe puts it. He says, some judgment is permitted and some is not. While Christians are not to judge one another's motives or ministries, we are certainly expected to be honest about each other's conduct. Again, part of our responsibility as brothers and sisters in the church, is to exhort and get people back on track who have gotten off course. And the only way to see if they are off course is to judge and observe their actions. You know, the loving and caring thing this this Corinthian church should have done would have been to judge this man's actions and not let it slide. That's what Paul does. As he pretty straightforwardly says, I'm not even near you guys. I'm not even there. I'm in another place. I'm in Ephesus, and I'm judging this guy and all the horrible act that, acts that he's doing. You know, Paul hears about this man's lifestyle. He calls himself a Christian. He looks at God's word, and he weighs the two, and he said, there's something wrong, something really wrong. And so he's addressing it. And look what he says in verse four and five. It says, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when you are gathered together along with my spirit, with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, Deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of the flesh that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. That's intense. What fall? That's brutal. Hand him over to Satan? You want this guy to go to hell? That's not what Paul's saying. You know, sometimes I think we have this, this fairy tale, this make-believe idea of God versus the devil where God represents all things good and Satan all things bad. And God is is standing there in heaven and Satan is is down below, standing there in hell. And we, we might think that they are even equals, but opposites, that they are equivalent in power and they are at war. One is the light side, one is the dark side. Who will prevail? Dun, 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 right? Well, I will say God is all good and Satan is evil, but they are not equals. God is God, and Satan is a created being who stands no chance against God. 
And remember that Satan is not ruling in hell right now. Hell was created for Satan and the fallen angels for their judgment. And God will one day cast them there. And unfortunately, those who do not turn to the Lord will go there as well. But Satan is, is not just ruling down in hell right now. Now, the Bible tells us that Satan is roaming the earth, seeking whom he may devour. He is the adversary. He is the accuser of the brethren, of the church. He is the ruler of this world. And so Paul is not saying that he wants this man abolished and cast down to hell. It's, it's actually the opposite. He sends him out of the church, out of the fellowship of the believers in hope that he would come to repentance and be restored to the church. And by sending this man out of the church, he is putting him out into Satan's arena. And when this man is out there in the world, he will be alone to fight his battle. He will not have the fellowship or the guidance or the security of the church any longer. It, it, it might be new for us to understand this, but unlike what we experience here in the United States, there are not churches on every corner back then at this time. The, the man, if he was kicked out of this church, he could not just walk into another building, pick an aisle, and start lifting his hands in praise, singing a familiar praise song. He could not do that. No, there was one body of believers here at this time, and if he was disciplined and removed from the church, he was on his own. That was it. He, he was instructed not to be in fellowship with, with any of them. And we might think, well, that's not right. You know, without the church, he will continue to be deceived by Satan and stay in, in, in this sin. That's not loving to send him out. But this is actually the most loving thing to do because it's in sending this man out into the world away from the protection of the church that he is given the opportunity to realize his choices are deadly wrong, that his sin will not fully satisfy his life, and it's out there he may realize again how good God is, as he may once again desire the things of the Lord and long to be back with, with him and the church. And you know, this plan of Paul's actually possibly worked. According to 2 Corinthians, the church followed Paul's instruction, and it seemed to have worked so well that possibly Paul is referring to this man's coming to repentance and longing to be restored. You know, maybe you have experienced falling into sin after some time of being a Christian. And if you have, if you've walked away from the Lord, if you backslid in any way, then you know that there is nothing more miserable than having once experienced such intimate fellowship and communion with the Lord and his people only for it to be removed from you. And I do, I hope you find this to be true, but church is really a haven. It's a place to be built up and encouraged and guarded in your faith. It's a spiritual place where, where Jesus does inhabit his people's praises. It's the place we are focused on God's word. It's the place God will use the gifts he has given each person to strengthen our faith, to be there for you with wise words, godly counsel, and to pray for you. You know, Paul, he, he makes this judgment. He communicates with them at a time where technology was pretty much non-existent. Right? It, he's writing letters, and he says, I am with you in spirit, in the spirit. You know, I, I believe even though we are not away from each other because of a sin issue, many of us are really feeling that, that sadness, that emptiness of not being around each other. You know, I love, I love to refer to Thursday nights as family night. So these are special secrets on family night. <laughs> but I just, just ask that as a family, we will pray that the Lord would do a great work, that he would do a miraculous work, that we can all be back together in his house again. But we have to know, too, that the church is not the building. And so for us as the church, the people of the church, we need to keep looking at ways to be the body of Christ that God intends for us to be right now in the ways that we can. You know, if we are all reaching out to those we know, 
God will do a work in the body. If you are struggling in any way, reach out. You should be doing it anyway. Maybe you're one who has just been tuning in. God, God wants you to reach out to those. If, if there's anyone you know at this church, reach out to them. Check up on them. Tell them how you are doing. Contact us. We want to be there for you guys. That's what the church is for, for. Don't be alone out there. I know that's a little side rant. But the reason Paul sent this man out of the church was so he would see what life was like without the protection and guidance of the church. Paul does not hate or want to see this man destroyed by Satan, but puts him out there so he can repent and come back to Jesus. Paul doesn't want to see his soul destroyed but saved. Now, this is exactly why he tells them to put, out, put this man out because he cares about this man's soul. And sometimes people have to get as low as they can before they come to the light. I think the prodigal son is a great example of this. I mean, you all know the story, so I'm not going to, to describe it completely. But when did he come to the realization that he needed to go back home? When he was at his end, when his inheritance was wasted, when famine came upon the land and he was starving, we, when he was in the pig's slop. But then it says, he came to himself and realized when, when, when life, when life the, the life of the simple servant, how the life of the simple servant was back then. And he looks at the, at the servant's life, he thinks about it, and he's like, I can take that life. I will go back there and I will live the life of a servant. And as he returned, he learned really quickly that he was not only a servant in the household of his father, but a son. A son who is so loved by the father that the father forgave him and ran to him. And he made a feast and he clothed him with the finest apparel. This is the life of the Christian who is loved by the father. But sometimes it takes, what does it say? The destruction of the flesh. He was handed over for the destruction of the flesh. Sometimes it takes the destruction of the flesh to get someone to that place. And this is why this man was sent out. Not the destruction of his soul or his life, but his flesh. You know, pray for those in your life. I, I, I pray for those I see on social media that they won't have to learn fully that way. But sometimes it takes swimming with the pigs to realize how much better life is with Jesus. This was one reason this man was sent out, so he can be restored. But it was also for another reason, for the purification of the church. Look at verse 6. It says, your glorifying is not good. Your glorying is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump or the whole batch of dough or bread? Now, I'm not a baker. I'm probably the worst baker ever. But from my understanding, if the leaven is mixed with the dough, it will spread throughout the entire batch and it will cause the dough to be expanded as the dough is baked. Don't you love bread? Oh, man. Sourdough is the best. Some butter, heavy on the butter and toast sourdough. I think we usually have like three different brands of sourdough at one time at our house. Plus someone gave my wife a sourdough starter this past week. I don't even know what that means, but if it makes sourdough, I am ecstatic. But it has nothing to do with this. But what we read here is just a little bit of leaven will affect and change the entire lump or loaf. And unlike what sourdough does to my emotional state, the leaven Paul is talking about is not good. Jesus used leaven to symbolize the hypocrisy and corruption of the anti-Jesus Jewish leaders, and it is also used to talk about sin and the effect it has on us. And here Paul is saying, you boasting how, about how loving you are by ignoring this man's gross sin is not good. You allowing the sin, this leaven to stay in the church is tainting the entire body. And so he says in verse seven, therefore purge out the old leaven that you may be a new lump since you truly are unleavened. For indeed Christ, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. You are to send this man out 
because it is needed for him, but also because it is needed for you as a church. Rid the church of this acceptance of sin because that is not who you are. Jesus did not come and redeem your life so you could continue in sin or boast about your love for one who's doing these things. No, when you came to saving faith, you became a new creation in him. Those old things have passed away and now things are made new. You are not full of leaven and sin. You are no longer a slave to its bondage. You are set free. Live that way. Live the life that Christ has for you. And as a church, focus on purity. And verse eight, therefore let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. This one sin was affecting the whole church and what they stood for. You know, anyone could look in at us as a church and say, ask, what does that church stand for? What is that church all about? And it may be about grace and love, but never in compromising the truth of God's word. I think this is a good sobering question for us at Calvary Chapel LAX. What do people see when they look in at us? Is it real love and care for the body of believers? Is it reaching the lost for Christ? Is it the gospel and all of God's word guiding and instructing our lives? Or does it look just like the world? You know, if people walk into these doors of the church, will they get the same thing that they get out there? Will they get immorality? Will they get division? Will they get people, will they see people pursuing fame and fortune? Or will they get something so different? A bright shining light, salt of the earth, a city on a hill that is all about Jesus. You know, Calvary Chapel LAX is not a perfect church. We are not perfect people. I am not a perfect pastor. Andrew, he's almost there. We will not do everything right. But our priority is, is God, is Jesus, is teaching God's word and loving his people. And when the world looks in, may they see our devotion to our Savior. May they see our devotion to his word and one another. And as we seek to individually and as a group become more like Jesus, may our lives and this church always be about Jesus and his word without compromise. Without compromise, no matter what we feel, no matter what our culture says, but what the word instructs. We fall short every day, but we get up. And as, as we looked at Sunday, we, we press on. And we are to keep giving our all for the Lord, to lay hold of that which Christ has laid hold of us, to reach for that prize, to keep going. This was not what was happening in the Corinthian church. In verse nine, it says, I wrote to you in my epistle not to keep company with sexually immoral people. Yet I certainly did not mean with the sexually immoral people of this world or with the covetous or extortioners or idolaters since then you would need to get out of the world. But now I have written to you not to keep company with anyone named a brother who is sexually immoral or covetous or an idolater or a reviler or a drunkard or an extortioner not even to eat with such a person. Paul had already written a letter to this church at Corinth before this epistle. But that letter is not scripture. That letter we do not have. But he mentions it. And he indicates that in that letter, he was dealing with sexually immoral people. What to do? So this church should have known what to do. They were just not doing it. And so Paul reminds them, he, he says, don't keep company with people who are sexually immoral in the church. And again, this is not someone who is trying, who is in that battle, who is, who, is, who is doing all that they can to walk strong but struggles and falls. He's not talking about that. He's talking about one who is proud of their sin, who doesn't humbly agree with what God's word says. They aren't trying to get right. And Paul explains to the church not to give them the gratification of having fellowship with them. He's like, don't even go there. Don't allow them to have intimate fellowship with you when they are in this state of rebellion. 
Don't give them the, the luxury of, of intimate fellowship. Don't even associate with them when they are mocking God by their arrogance. I mean, he is serious about what he said here. The purity of the church and their soul, that person's soul, is too important to take his instruction lightly. But notice, this is for the people in the church, people who call themselves Christians, who are living completely contrary lives to the ways of Christ. That's who Paul is talking about, avoiding. He's not talking about people who are outside of the church, not unbelievers who are doing these things, who are in their sin. Paul says, you don't have to stop interacting with them. He says, because these are the majority of people in the world. I mean, how can you possibly avoid all the people in the world unless you're in a quarantine time like we are? But under normal circumstances, the only way you would be able to avoid these people is if you left this world because these people are all over the place. Paul doesn't want us to avoid those who don't know the Lord and are of this world because we are to be bright, shining lights to them. They should look at our lives and see that we are different than this world. And when they see the purity we walk in, when they see the priority of our lives, when they see the hope we have, they will want it too. So we are not to avoid those unbelievers, but be examples to them. But we are to avoid those who claim to be Christians, who say, I love Jesus, and then live completely opposed to all the things he died for. Paul says, don't be indifferent. Don't be casual regarding this in any way. And don't even let the world look in and see that we are just like them, or even worse than them, by accepting things that are, are far worse than what they do. No, walk and make holiness a priority in your life and the body of Christ. And in verse 12 it says, For what have I to do with judging those also who are outside? Do you not judge those who are inside? But those who are outside, God judges. Therefore, put away from yourselves the evil person. These verses are pretty sobering verses. You know, making judgments about unbelievers is not our greatest concern. But sometimes we make it our greatest concern. You know, that is fully God's responsibility. He will judge them. But we so easily do that. We look outside at everything the world is doing, all that they are standing for, and we judge it. We get mad about it. We want to fix it. But our priority needs to be to fix what is taking place in the church, the church of Jesus. And we, as a church, should be accountable to one another. It's an important responsibility that we as Christians have. The church is the family of God, and we need to focus in on us. And if someone is in sin, we are not to, to cover our eyes, we're not to just accept it, we are to help them get back on track. You know, Galatians 6, one says the goal should be to restore with gentleness. And know this, it, it also tells us that we can all stumble, we can all fall, and we need each other. It says that, considering yourself lest you also be tempted when we're restoring our brothers and sisters. You know, I think the greatest person we need to judge, we need to examine, if you will, is ourselves. You know, we're talking about Jesus when he talked about judging. Judge not lest you be judged. He talked about the log in the eye. You know, too often we have a huge plank, a massive sequoia tree shoved in our eye. And we are like, you have to remove that little tiny splinter from your eye right now. Jesus said, remove the plank. Remove that sequoia from, your, from yours and then deal with your brother. You know, today maybe we're thinking as we're going through this, oh man, I know a person just like that. Maybe they're not doing that sin, but I know someone who could, could, could really, who could use a really good rebuke right now. Maybe that's you. Maybe that's, that's us. Maybe we are that man. Maybe we're in some deep kind of sin, something that is, is holding us back from getting deeper with the Lord. Rid it. Rid the leaven from your life. Now is the time to do it, to be right with the Lord, to keep growing in Him, to, to devote ourselves fully to Him. You know, people say to me, 
and I kind of get, get cracked up at this. They're like, I'm so bored. Don't be bored. Don't be bored. Grow with the Lord. Grow with him. Deepen your relationship with him. Man, I, I, I even started picking up the guitar again. And I, like my fingers almost bled because it's been so long since I played guitar. But, but, but dive into your faith. If you have some free time, grow in your faith even more. You know, do what you gotta do. I've been so blessed by seeing some people. And I know that so many of you are, are struggling. So many of you are going through hard times and not even fear of getting sick. You know, you, it's, just, it's just everything that's going on. Just being in your home is difficult. Whatever it may be, whatever you're, you're struggling with, use this time to get drawn nearer to the Lord, to get closer to Him, to allow Him to speak to you, get deeper into His Word. There's no reason to be bored. There's a reason to grow. There's a reason to, to press on. There's a reason to walk uprightly in the life that He has given to us. You know, in closing, as we do think about what God is doing at this time, personally, I, I'm, I'm so thankful just talking about the message that and just, you know, the excommunication, the kicking people out of the church. You know, if we just go through God's word, which we've been doing, people will probably leave who don't want to hear it. And that, that's, that's our saving grace, really, is we just teach the Bible, and if people don't like it, they usually leave, because what they're going to get here is the Bible. We are going to teach the Bible. But I do pray that those who don't know the Lord will be drawn to it, that the Lord will convict the Holy Spirit will convict them of their sin and the judgment that's going to come upon their lives. And I've been so blessed by, by many of you that have told me that there, that there are people in your lives that you've invited to tune in. And that, that you've been, some people have told me that, that people have started to tune in and they are watching our service. And I, and I think what a great opportunity that we have as a church right now to see the the. The, the kingdom further, furthered, to see God's name glorified more. And yeah, it stinks right now. And it, it's probably, it probably stinks in more ways than not. But we have to believe that God is using all of this for his glory. And don't you wish you could see every single way that God is using this for his glory and to bring honor to himself? I'd love to see it. But one thing we can do is trust that he is. He's, he's using this. And one way is by people tuning in and hearing the gospel and hearing the good news. And I don't just mean at Calvary Chapel LAX. I, I mean throughout. I've heard amazing stories about people who have tuned in and have given their lives to the Lord. And I can't wait to hear more, to see more lives changed and how gra- God is grabbing people's hearts. And so church, keep it up. Keep it up. You know, we're not physically together right now, but God is still working. He's still working in this church. He's still, and that means he's working in your life. Not this building with a few of us here. He is, but he's working in your life too. And and spend this time growing. Spend this this time communing and, and giving all you can to the Lord, deepening your relationship with him. He's conforming you to the image of Christ, but you do your part. You do your part as well. Let's trust him. Let's encourage one another. Let's walk in purity ourselves and be examples to those in our lives who do not know the Lord, but let's just draw near to the Lord every chance we get. Amen? Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your love. We thank you for this night in your word. We thank you for your grace. I pray for each person out there right now who is battling in ways that you know and they know. But I pray tonight that they would know you deeper. That if there's anyone who is struggling in sin, I pray if there's anyone even tonight who doesn't know you, who maybe has been in the church, but has walked away from the church, maybe they never gave their life to you, maybe they have, but they have wandered away. Maybe they've tuned in tonight and they know that you are the answer, that you will come with arms wide open, you will embrace them. You will grab hold of them and you will not let them go. You will adorn them with the most beautiful clothing and you will have a feast for them. I pray that we would feast on your goodness. 
and realize that you are always faithful to us. I pray that the cry of our heart would be you, to know you deeper, to be right with you, and to honor you with our lives. Thank you so much for this night, Lord. I, and I do just lift up those who need that special touch from you tonight. Touch them. Be honored through all of our lives. May we worship you in spirit and in truth tonight. We thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's spend a little bit of time worshiping the Lord and just pour out your heart to him. If there's anything you need, he's the one who can grant it. He's the one who can be there for you greater than anyone else. So cry out to him tonight. Let's worship him. God bless you.